for the very kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to be back home at Stony Brook. Uh, so wonderful to be here, so many good memories with uh, Professor Mignone. Uh, I was really deeply touched uh, by you know, these happenings and etc. Uh, so it's really a big emotion for me to be here and uh, um, I think Angelo expressed wonderfully how, how grateful we are right, to, to what Mario Mignone has done for, for, for us and for you know, thousands of people before us and uh, how many lives will be touched through the center in the future is right. It's quite amazing uh, to think about it, so. Um, okay, uh, that said, uh, I will uh, uh, segue into my presentation for the day, which is uh, a joint work with Peter De Scioli, Associate Professor at Stony Brook in the Department of Political Science. Um, so this presentation is uh, um, deeply about the European Union, the crisis of the European Union, the sovereign debt crisis that really um, affected us in so many ways, both in Italy and, uh, and uh, uh, in Greece. Um, but here we take uh, um, a stance that the philosophically inclined here will uh, uh, like, hopefully. Um, yet uh, with a novel spin, which is an experimental spin. So it will be a very quantitative presentation, but deeply rooted in moral philosophy. So let's start from the Greek crisis. Uh, Greece, um, during the sovereign debt crisis, was uh, uh, at a crossroads, at a dilemma. The dilemma that Greece was facing was whether to pay its debts to, say, Germany and uh, other countries on the international scene. The consequence of paying uh, its debts would be long lines in front of the unemployment centers, uh, such as this one in Athens, because they have to cut government programs, they have you know, to cut wages to hospital workers, to all sorts of uh, public employees. Or, just up for default, haircuts, which would force German taxpayers to reach deep into their pockets. So what should be done here? But this is a dilemma that is not over yet because uh, countries like Greece, Italy, um, Portugal, Spain still have a lot of outstanding debt that will have to be repaid at some point. So the 2010 crisis is not just one moment in time that is almost 10 years away. It's something that will be recurrent. And as we speak, the Italian debt is the most dangerous debt in the Eurozone. So it's still something that we should keep in mind. But then question that I ask here is a public opinion question. So it's do people think that a government should repay its international debt even if this creates severe hardship for its citizens? Because this is really the core of the question um, if we want to move on and try to, to find a solution to this problem. Um, repaying the debt is really important, is a, is a, is a necessity, is a priority. But as we saw in Greece, it carries a big cost, a big human toll. And actually there are contributions uh, by um, some scholars like uh, uh, David Stuckler at Bocconi that show that there was actually a human lives cost to the Greek crisis, for instance. Uh, they found that cuts to hospitals generated uh, more deaths, more, more uh, the death rate increased uh, by uh, a non-negligible amount in Greece, for instance. Uh, so this is the question that we will focus on in this, uh, in this paper. On the one extreme, uh, one answer could be pay your debts no matter what. This would be the Kantian stance, the ontological stance. Pay your debts because this is your moral obligation. This is what is right to do because you are in a contract and the contract says you have to repay your debts. Who cares about the consequences, how dire and grave they may be? On the other extreme, we have the Bentamite idea, the consequentialist idea, that really the answer depends on the consequences of paying the debt. Yes, there is a contract, but really it's how many jobs will be at stake, for instance, that should drive our action and our public opinion support. Why is this important? Well, because if you ask Greeks whether they should repay their debt, we already know the answer. If you ask the Germans whether Greeks would have to repay the debts, we already know the answer too. So here we focus on 
a third party view of people who have nothing to do with the problem who are impartial observers. Because what we saw from the crisis was that really what mattered was uh, which side uh, the international public opinion took, where the US uh, were standing, where European public opinion was standing on this, with the Germans or with the Greeks, with the deontological perspective, pay your debts, or with the consequentialist perspective. So basically then our hypothesis will be that people might be deontological about that or consequentialist about that, or something in between. So our methodology um, draws from moral psychology. Have you ever seen this before? You know what this is even uh, named? <coughs> this is the NECA cube, okay? So one particular feature of the NECA cube is that if I call this room, now tell me which face is in the front of this cube. The one that says kill one person or the one that says save five people? Does everyone see the same thing? Probably not. Depending on how you look at it, kill one person will jump at you and say five people will be receding in the background or vice versa. This is the trolley problem, a very important, famous problem in moral psychology. Basically, in the trolley problem, there's a one runaway trolley which will kill five people unless you do something. You can hit the switch, and if you hit the switch, the trolley will just kill one person, and you have saved the people. Now then the question is, uh, if, you, if you hit the switch, you are a killer, because you killed the one guy. If you don't do anything, five people will be, will, be, will be killed. So this is basically a very famous problem in moral psychology. What should you do? Should you do what is uh, consequential, from a consequentialist perspective, correct? You know, hit the switch to kill this person, to save uh, a greater number of lives. Or, or, or just, you know, healing is something I will never do, so, well, whatever, five people will die, I will never hit the switch. So this is the, the method that, that we exploit to study this dilemma about Greek, uh, uh, Greek or Italian international public debt, and we apply it to political science. So the important part here is that there is no clear-cut answer. Depending on how you look at this, one side of the NECA cube will jump at you or the other. This is really important. So you can notice then that there is a formula really for moral dilemma in politics. And this formula is composed by a prohibited action, which was killing in our example, but it could be a nuclear attack on Japan, increasing taxes on the wealthy, editing human genes, building nuclear reactors, or defaulting on the debt. That would be the prohibited action. What uh, uh, would violate the Kantian uh, uh, moral imperative, vis-a-vis -vis the better consequences. Well, why would you, would you drop the bomb on Japan? Well, because you can end World War II. Why would you edit human genes, even if you're religiously against it? Well, because you can cure disease. Why would you default on the debt? Well, because you can relieve hardship during a crisis. So you can see that this pattern, thinking in terms of moral psychology, is really useful to think about many, many political problems that we face. And so this is basically exactly what we did. We presented participants with this moral dilemma with two imaginary countries, Avalon and Fredonia, who are in the same region. A few years ago, Avalon suffered hard times, and Fredonia loaned 100 billion to Avalon. Avalon promised to repay the loan regularly over the course of 15 years. Now, a few years later, Avalon is experiencing more economic hardship and cannot afford to make uh, its loan payments. The only way Avalon can make the payments is by drastically cutting its government programs. With these cuts, 6,000 citizens would lose their jobs. At the same time, Fridonia has stressed that Avalon must continue to repay the loan. If Avalon stops repaying the loan, then Fridonia will have to make big cuts to its government programs and 5,000 citizens would lose their jobs. In this difficult situation, the government of Avalon continues to debate whether they should stop repaying the loan or cut government programs for their citizens. So what should the government do? Repay or default? We can take a poll if you want. Does anybody have any strong opinions about who, who votes for repaying? 
who votes for Repain, anybody? So here we are in Italy, of course, so everybody wants to default, <laughs> that's pretty clear. Um, well, default it would be the consequentialist action here because it would uh, uh, save 6,000 jobs, right, versus 5,000 that would be lost by in the other scenario. Uh, so what we did in the first experiment, we asked this to about 650 Americans on Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is just a cheap, convenient sample where you can get participants really well. It's, it's pretty diverse. It's not national representative, but it's good for experiments like this. They read just this scenario. We asked them, what should the government do? Uh, repay or, or default? And then we asked them about their moral judgments. Would it be wrong to default? Would it be wrong to repay? How wrong would that be? Should the government be punished for doing this? So the design of this experiment was a four by two, which simply means that we varied the two things. One thing was the damage ratio. So the damage ratio in the, in the example we just read was 6,000 to 5,000, which is 1.2. Then if you do 10,000 uh, versus 5,000 is, is twice, etc. cetera. We, we, we went up to 100,000 jobs lost uh, if, you, um, if, you, if you do default versus, uh, versus repay. We kept it constant, how many jobs the creditor would lose to, to 5,000. And the other thing that we vary was whether the default was full or partial. This is important because it's more realistic to think of a partial default. Greece actually did the partial default in the end, didn't fully default. Um, and also because partial default may signal the intention to still collaborate with the, with the creditor instead of just saying, oh, I'll just fully default. I will just not pay anything. So just to remind you, there are two hypotheses here that people will be deontological or consequentialist about that. And notice that uh, there's no right or wrong answer. It's like the NECA cube, one side could jump at you, the other side could, could be more important to you. There's just no right or wrong answer. Um, notice that there could be also something in between. So let's look at the results. Here on the x-axis you can see our ratio of, of lost jobs. And on the y-axis, the percent of people who said that the government should default on the debt. And here's the 50% line of disagreement or agreement. So here you see in the full default case, about one quarter of participants said uh, to default on the debt. In the 1.2 case, which is the one we just read. Now, as the damage increases, however, you see that more and more people are saying that uh, uh, the government should default. When default was partial, people were more lenient uh, toward, uh, toward the debtor, saying increasingly that the government should default on the debt. Okay, so this is interesting if you look at the 50% line. So it means basically if you're below the 50% line, there is a majority, um, th there's a majority uh, of people who, who say that uh, you should be not to default, you should be repaying, and if you're above that line, uh, you see the opposite. So you can see, for instance, that in the 2x case, there's just a lot of disagreement. People are just completely split. They don't know what to do, this or that. Um, looking at moral judgments, again, on the x-axis, our damage ratio, y-axis percentage of people that say it would be wrong to default, well, most people said it would be wrong to default uh, in the case we just read. So they were not like you. They all think you should pay your debts, uh, so to speak. But as the consequences uh, become uh, uh, less, uh, become worse, they, there is not really a decline in this. So they're pretty fiercely ontological. It doesn't really matter uh, for the moral judgment how, how bad the consequences would be. In partial default, we say a similar pattern. We see that as consequences get worse, people don't really change, uh, don't, don't really change their judgment. Even if, of course, partial default is less bad than than full default. Now, is it wrong to cut programs, government programs? You can see that most people think it would not be that wrong. As the consequences uh, get uh, worse, yeah, you do see some uh, some increase, but not a dramatic increase. And we find a similar pattern for partial default. 
So here, notice the difference between the policy prescription, what should the government do, and what you feel is morally right or wrong. So overall, it really looks like austerity versus default is a difficult question. It's a, an unwinnable case because 20% of the people, one in five, said that both options would be wrong. So if you're a government, there's nothing that you can do right. There's just no way out. You can't win. Um, only, only one in five say that both options would be permissible, and the rest just says either one or the other is, uh, is, uh, is wrong. Another piece of evidence that this is a difficult dilemma is you know, by looking at participant comments. Uh, one person said Avalon has a responsibility to pay the loan regardless of how many jobs it has to cut. They need to do what is right. So this person is very clear about their priorities in life. Um, this guy says, I feel it would be more morally wrong if more citizens lost their jobs than if it was a fewer amount who lost their jobs. So this person is consequentialist on the contrary. And then the other person said, basically it's just a really tough situation with no good answer. And good luck to you if you're in government, right? Um, now, given this, we want to dig a bit deeper and go to a national sample of Americans uh, in experiment two. So to look specifically at liberals versus conservatives. <coughs> and again, with the spirit of looking at what impartial observers would say about this. So we went to SSI uh, to get this national representative sample, about 1,100 uh, 1, people. They read the same scenario, and then we asked them about the moral judgments and what should the government do. Here the design was much simpler. It was just a two by one, where we just varied the damage ratio between twice uh, the amount of damage and 20 times the amount of damage. So basically the debtor would lose 10,000 or 100,000 jobs in case of default. So looking at the results, uh, we can just uh, focus here on ideology, which was our main goal here. X axis the ratio of lost jobs, Y axis the percentage who said that the government should default on the debt. Looking at liberals first, we see uh, that uh, as the consequences became uh, worse, uh, uh, they said uh, that the government should default slightly more. The difference is not that big, but uh, still uh, there is some, uh, some difference. Basically, in a, when 10,000 people lose their job, people are really uh, confused about what the government should do, 50-50, but there is a, a slight majority if 100,000 people lose their job. Now, conservatives, we see uh, a similar pattern. Conservatives are certainly uh, more against the default, but still you see as, as the damage increases, they um, increasingly support default. Now, is it wrong to default? Let's see how they reply. Um, well, liberals tend to say it's pretty wrong to default. And again, no real change if consequences get really bad. Conservatives say, yes, it's a bit, a bit more wrong to default compared to liberals, but still no change if, if consequences become worse. Is it wrong to cut programs? Again, we, we see slight changes, but similar pattern as before, where, whereby conservatives certainly are a bit more deontological about that. So in sum, we see that people, unlike you guys, say that yes, uh, countries should pay, should pay their debts, but they are sensitive uh, um, to the damage ratio in uh, prescribing what the government should do. So the policy aspect is something to keep in mind. Um, for the policy aspect, public opinion, in this case, was sensitive to, to increasing damage. Partial default also was something that made people more favorable toward default as a policy prescription. There were significant differences between liberals and conservatives. Conservatives were um, more opposed to default than liberals. So this has implications for the debate on austerity versus default. One thing to keep in mind is that uh, um, also in the European Union, uh, the northern countries uh, tend, uh, I think, still to be ruled by conservative parties, if you think about it, uh, Germany, but also well, um, uh, several countries in the north, whereas in the south we see a bit more a mix of uh, liberal governments, left-wing governments. So this is also something to keep in mind, even if this was just a US, US sample. 
and one important takeaway is that deontological reasoning can come in, in the way of public welfare. Because deontological reasoning, as you saw here, says basically, I don't care about how bad the consequences are, you should repay your debt. And if more and more people are deontological, as here was the case, anything can fly. I also did a study with lives on the line that I'm not showing you here, and I saw similar results. So even when lives were on the line, uh, debts had to be repaid anyway, which is quite striking, but this is what happened in Greece. This is just what happened in Greece, so uh, it's not surprising in that sense. Um, so specific implications for the EU debt crisis. We do have here some advice for our Greek friends. Uh, the framing of the Greek crisis may help um, tilt uh, public opinion toward uh, more acceptance of and more support for default, as we saw, in terms, at least in terms of policy prescription. Um, and notice, of course, uh, this, uh, this aspect about conservatives. But notice, if you like, uh, to think of morality, that even if the policy prescription was, uh, was to, to default when consequences were bad, still people want to say, no, but I'm a good guy, I don't support default. So this is something very interesting from a moral, uh, uh, moral psychology perspective. So this is also relevant, uh, sadly, for the Italian debt for the reasons that I explained before. We, are, uh, we have the, the riskiest debt in, in the Eurozone, and, and this problem will be a problem that we will face too, um, unfortunately, quite soon. So I want to leave you just with this, which is in the hallway at Bocconi. It's called E dimitte nobis debita nostra. It's a piece of art that means um, just uh, and uh, forgive us our, our sins. It's from the Pater Noster, from the Our Father. Now, the, the funny part is that in Latin, but also in German, the word, the word debt and the word sin are the same word. And it happens that Germany, unlike Italy, is not a Catholic country, so there's no confession, there's no remission of the sins. If you sin, you sin and you have to repay. <laughs> there's no going to the... <laughs> so this is something uh, actually uh, that should uh, get us thinking. Mediterranean countries, Catholic countries, <coughs> even people who are not religious tend to have this idea, well, okay, you sinned, okay, you have a debt, that's okay, <laughs> you can just you know, forgive me of my debt. Uh, Northerners don't think that way, uh, and Americans don't think that way either. This is a, not a Catholic society uh, from the point of view of deep cultural heritage. So I leave you this.
who have this unfortunate idea. And who is paying that? I mean, the ones who decided were not Italians. They were from Piedmont or whatever. And the ones who were paying that were Italians, as a matter of fact. The same happens when we go to, to your splendid uh, uh, speech. Right? Once again, if we look at innovation in the coming in the last decade, many things you said are not always perfect. <laughs> Every year, Oxfam report comes to Davos, and every year we see how the, the polarization of wealth is proceeding, uh, creating uh, poor in technical terms, which are not very poor, they are not disparate, but they become poorer, and the extremely rich uh, who do not invest anymore. Because the uh, assumption of capitalism was giving and I invest and I create wealth, innovation, and jobs. It's no more. It doesn't happen. I give you not Oxfam um, information. World Bank, which is not precisely the Catholic Church uh, striving for poor people. So World Bank report on January. In the last 15 years, in the American real economy, the quota of uh, profits going to the workers lowered from 65 to 58% of the product. It implies that every $100 of production, the owners, what we may call the capitalists, took half dollar more than the year before, every year. And they do not invest anymore. Do not innovate anymore. And this is related to the workers and the consumers. The markup has the same process. And the process is accelerating because World Bank informs us that from 1980, the work have increased 43% in real terms. I mean, it's astonishing. But what is even more interesting is that the 20% of this 43% is between 2010 and now, in nine <coughs> years. Less, because the data data. Your study spoke about the public debt and should it a person pay or not. But on the other side, when you were talking about the payment, it referred to the individuals. And there should be a distinction between the public debt and the uh, private debt. On a private debt, I believe that morality applies. But on a public debt, it doesn't. Because, as we have seen very lately, or already now for the past 10 years, that a government can actually print the money, and they do print the money. So therefore, what is the austerity program that these people are entering? So the, the, the study that you presented, it seems to me that it's confusing in the sense that you do not distinguish those two debts, a private against a public debt. For uh, Angela Martelli, the relevance of knowledge uh, to the economy is not a strength. It, it's a relevant relevance. Uh, how do we determine, and this is especially a problem for education, uh, what kind of knowledge to impart so that we have productive citizens of the future? we discover that even uh, forms of knowledge that are not so relevant to technology, for instance, uh, can be useful to the economy. Uh, it's like public information and dealing with people and whatnot. So that issue remains. What kind of knowledge? Uh, and I want to get 
to the plant that you, uh, you are an expert now. So as an expert, uh, what would you advise Italy, which has a large debt, <laughs> to do and why? I'm more interested in the why. Um, okay, I'll go in order. Um, Bernardo, uh, yes, great points, uh, and uh, you basically call me to go to work and run those conditions as well. It's uh, my plan has been a plan for a while to run these conditions. Basically, in which we introduced predatory lending. We know that there was predatory lending in the Greek crisis. Goldman Sachs did have a role, of course. Goldman Sachs is not the, the, the only culprit. There was a government that was very happy to be receiving predatory lending. Um, and then the difference between the people and the government. So absolutely, I think those are conditions to be run. This is just a very general case, just to start uh, understanding the basics of the question. But there is a lot more we need to do to make it more relevant to the real world, for sure. Yeah, so that would be. Otherwise, it seems morality, you know, the weakness, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. It really depends where it comes from, how is the money used, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then Anthony Messina, yes, that's another condition we need to run. The time horizon is really important uh, because, of course, you could even argue that the real consequential stance is, but hey, if we default down the line, the consequences will be worse. So then, so here we really try to put people in the mindset of, hey, it's urgent, it's happening right now. But you could write the vignette differently. You could people put people in a different time horizon perspective. So, I, yeah, I need to go get uh, get this data as well. Um, and it's fascinating what you suggest that then liberals and conservatives will be closer together. This is just something I need to think more about. It's an interesting idea because normally one would think well, conservatives are just uh, more maybe they, especially libertarians, maybe care more about property rights. But so that would be interesting to see what happens. Uh, there. Uh, even if, however, in this crisis, it seems like there is no future. Policy making, especially these days, seems to be very short term. And so, especially because of the electoral cycle, the multi party system, it seems really that since the government can fall, to, can fall tomorrow, we really need to see what uh, the latest polls say. And so, politicians even invite the short, short termism. So, in that sense, I completely agree that we should all think long term, but uh, it's really hard uh, these days with social media politicians, like you know, the Italian ones, or even in the US, we have prominent examples, to make people think uh, short term. Uh, so I see two different competing interests over there. Um, yeah, Professor Troiani. Um, so in part, I think it's uh, related to Bernardo Piccicchi's uh, remark about who, who, is, uh, uh, who made the debt, who is paying. But I think that's an inter another interesting condition to be, to be run, because here you're inviting the consideration of the intergenerational and intertemporal aspect of that, um, which I think actually is really important to understand climate change right now, the response to climate change. That is, is an intergenerational problem by design, right? Because, uh, and even from a spatial perspective, you have these Western countries that now are clean, however, which polluted the environment uh, enormously in the past. And now we are asking China to be clean. And then, except that China is, is you know, is uh, 1.3 billion people uh, and counting. And, and it's different from Europe in the 1800s that could afford, so to speak, to pollute. So I, I think these are all the great uh, points, which again mean go to work and get more data. I will do that. Um, OK, uh, just uh, to clarify with Vito, yes. Um, the public and private here in this experiment, it was really only about public debt, about the government debt. Even if uh, uh, I agree with you that we should also go look at a private case, interpersonal debt case. Um, during the, the, the crisis in the US, I'm talking about the 2008 crisis in the US, there was a lot of mentioning these people who added the swimming pool in the backyard and now suddenly they have to, they are bankrupt and they're asking, you know, the fellow Americans to bail them out after they have the nice, uh, maybe the, the cinema room uh, in the house and the, and the pool in the, in the backyard. So I think to look at the differences between the public debt and private debt, maybe also in an international comparison would be interesting. Because for the Italian, 
public that doesn't exist. Pantalone pays, we have this kind of, uh, which is, Pantalone is this, you know, carnival figure, so. Uh, whereas the private debt is, is a, we abhor private debt. We cannot stand private debt, uh, unlike other countries like the US. Um, so yes, other things to do on my work list, to-do list. Um, oh, the other point was the government can print money, yes, but not in the EU. That's the problem. In the Eurozone, the Italian government can do just nothing. The only thing you can do is to ju just tax or reduce spending, but you cannot print any money. So unless you have Draghi, well, of course, but now Draghi is gone, so yes, good luck. Um, yes. And uh, finally, <laughs> going to... Uh, uh, sell Yes. Morality can be thought about as choosing sides, and choosing sides is just uh, invites considerations about international politics. Um, so I think morality is also very much a public matter in international conflict. Um, one example I had uh, on the slide was uh, the American intervention in World War II, uh, dropping the nuclear bomb on Japan. And uh, that is actually a case that is uh, heftily studied in IR. Uh, as an, in fact, uh, a moral dilemma in that sense. It's not looked at from a moral psychology perspective, but certainly Nayar is a textbook case. Um, you know, Vietnam uh, is another big case in the US. Um, and then you can think about the situation where the private sphere enters the public sphere. So uh, abortion, the referendum on abortion, on divorce, in Italy, divorce, big, big, big topic. Yes, it's private morality. But then if I'm a politician and I endorse this or that, or I'm a country which allows this versus not, so let's think about uh, fertilization issues or, you know. Or, or, yeah, so I think uh, there's plenty of room, I argue, for, for that, also in the public sphere. And then what should Italy do? <laughs> uh, well, it depends on who is the, the agent, I guess, who is the, um, what's the goal? If you're a politician, we know they're doing already the right thing for themselves to get reelected or elected, so I will just skip that. Um, to just gain back control, maybe Angelo can help us with gain back control of the Italian debt. Uh, well, my answer is a pretty simple answer. So the only way to sustain the debt in public finance is simply to have a growth rate that is higher than the interest rate that you're paying on your debt. Okay. So that is the number one way to get out of the problem. If you grow more than what your average uh, uh, interest on the debt is, you're golden, okay? So in my opinion, the biggest antidote is to restart the growth. And restarting the growth in a country that is aging is by definition almost impossible. So the number one priority would be reduce the age, uh, or at least, uh, you know, uh, Somehow, either we have to have more children, or we have to have uh, more immigrants, or both. I don't know. Uh, this is, again, a moral question. I think it's a very moral question. Um, so I think that's really the answer. And then, of course, be more efficient with public spending. I mean, that's, but I think public efficiency of public spending alone will not, uh, will not solve the problem. Because if your, G, if your growth rate is lower than their interest rate, there's no way. If you're a private company, and uh, you're, you're borrowing $100 and you're making $90 out of it, well, you fail, you're bankrupt. And if you're a country, it's the same story, especially if you can print many money. So my argument is very economic uh, in this case. Not, uh, 